Good morning, wherever you may be watching this. Welcome to worship with Deep St. James United Church in this most unusual and yes, rather frightening time. On this fourth Sunday in the season of Lent, we hope that in joining us in this virtual worship, you will find comfort and renewed strength. In this and every season, each person, young and old, regular or newcomer, is warmly welcomed in our worship. My name is Jim Richardson, and I'm a member of the Glebe St. James Worship Ministry team. Glebe St. James is an affirming congregation in the United Church of Canada. Everyone and their gender, race, ethnicity, abilities, or sexual orientation is welcomed and celebrated in our worship. Yes, everybody. As we meet, we remember the gratitude of the Algonquin peoples on whose traditional, unceded, unsurrendered land our sanctuary stands. We acknowledge their story and their stewardship of the land and water, the plants and animals through many generations. Okay, let's name it. The COVID-19 novel of coronavirus is in our city. We are monitoring the evolving situation and taking guidance from public health and the United Church of Canada at the national and regional levels. All our church activities and rentals are suspended, cancelled, or postponed. The doors may be locked, but we will continue to worship as a community of faith in this virtual way. Technology in the form of Zoom software also enables us to continue things like our Lenten study series on Tuesday evenings at 7.30. Zoom enables participants to see and hear each other. We're also using it for meetings of council. In fact, at its Zoom-supported meeting on Wednesday, Glebe St. James Council agreed to set up our Glebe St. James COVID outreach fund of $10,000 to enable our outreach partners with their response, to help our outreach partners with their response to COVID-19. Those partners include the Carlington Community Chaplaincy, Centre 507, Centre Town Churches Social Action Committee, Centre Town Emergency Food Centre, Multi-Faith Housing, and the Odawa Native Friendship Centre. We are asking you to donate to this fund by mailing or dropping off a check in the church mailbox, or you can donate online through our website. Our friendly callers, part of our hospital care ministry, are busy checking in with those on our list to make sure you're okay. If you don't get a call and would like one, leave a message with the church office and someone will get in touch. We can arrange help with getting groceries or medications. Or perhaps you can help others by doing that kind of thing. Tell your friendly caller or call the church office. For now, our annual congregational meeting, which was to have taken place next Sunday, has been postponed. However, it will happen in some form before the end of June. Meanwhile, all members of council will remain in their present positions. At the end of this service, or elsewhere on the website, you will be able to view these and other announcement slides. This morning, our minister, Reverend Theresa Burnett Cole, will lead us in worship and preach. James Caswell, our minister of music, will lead us in music, and Chris Burbridge will read from scripture as will uh, Ruth Burnett Cole, will, we, uh, will offer a prayer. Though we are physically apart, let us bring our hearts, minds, and spirits together as we continue our journey through Lent, joining as one family in worship, mutual support, and celebration.
on this fourth Sunday of Lent, we come seeking God. In this time of uncertainty in our lives and our world, we come seeking God. Quieting our minds, opening our hearts, and waiting for the divine mystery to make itself known, we come to worship God. Our first hymn is number 371, Open My Eyes That I May See.
challenging times. This is a great reminder that when we say the word church, we're not talking about a physical location or a building. The church is a group of people who are following Jesus Christ together. And I'm not just talking about Glebe St. James. Today we join hands, sanitize hands, with every gospel preaching church in the world. And we declare together that we are church. And even though a virus can keep us out of our buildings for a while, there's no virus that can stop the church from being the church. Amen? So today, no matter where you are, I hope you feel a sense of unity and fellowship. You are a part of something very special. This has been a strange time. The news has changed constantly. It seems like every five minutes, something else is shutting down. And it's not just affecting people out there. It's affecting all of us. Our jobs, our school, our travel, our vacations, our church, it's hard to escape the shadow of coronavirus. This past week, I told my niece, you're going to be telling your grandkids about this. It's really that strange. And because it's such an unusual time, I thought a lot about what I wanted to say to you today. I consider just continuing with normal worship, but over the years I've learned that when there's a major event that rocks people's lives, that's what's on everybody's mind. So it's important as a church to speak to that situation. So today we need to talk about this. I believe it is a moment when all of us are faced with important decisions. We have choices. And the choices we make will have a major impact on our lives and on the people around us. So today I want to talk about the two big choices that we need to make. One internal choice and one external choice. And I'm going to anchor each one of these with a key scripture verse. So here's the first choice. In the coming days and weeks, choose faith over fear. Did you catch that? Choose faith over fear. Right now, we're being threatened by an invader called COVID-19. And for many of us, our natural response is to be afraid. And it reminds me of a time when the people of Israel were being threatened by a different kind of invader. There was an enemy na nation that was threatened to attack. So the people were shaken. And at that moment, God spoke these words to the prophet Isaiah. And this is Isaiah 41.10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. So God was saying to his people, I know your natural tendency is to fear, but I'm telling you, you have reason. You have resources to not be afraid. So what does that mean for us? Let's take a minute to think about what fear looks like and what faith looks like. So let's start with fear. Have you seen any fear lately? Yeah, I have. I've seen it in the eyes of people in the grocery store this week as they pile up toilet paper and Lysol into their shopping carts. I mean, just how much toilet paper does one person need? I saw it in the eyes of people as they watched their investments and retirement accounts sink lower and lower. I saw it in some of the social media posts I've been reading. These are clearly people who had crossed the line from concern into all-out worry, bordering on panic. Can you relate? Some of us are thinking, well, I'm not afraid. I just like watching the news a lot to stay updated. Listen, if you're watching the news more than an hour a day, if you're checking your phone constantly for coronavirus updates every 15 minutes, this thing has gotten a hold of your life. I love that second line in Isaiah 41.10, Do not be afraid, for I am your God. You know, I've noticed another kind of fear this week. It's not just a fear of the virus, it's more of a paranoia of the media or the prime minister or whichever political party you don't like. It's a suspicion that this whole coronavirus thing is a conspiracy devised by some devious people for some e evil reason. And I understand that we need not be gullible and not be tricked by everything that comes along. But I assure you, my friends, this is not a hoax. 
It's not a conspiracy. It's not a political issue. It's a real virus that's posing very real health risks to our world. So don't look anxious, anxiously around you for the villain in this story. That's just another way of giving in to fear. Fear is a powerful thing, because when we're afraid, it elevates certain hormones in our bodies that cause anxiety and depression. It actually compromises our immune system, which is ironic that when we're, because it makes us actually more likely to contract viruses. Not only that, but the research has found over and over again that when we're afraid, we don't think clearly. A couple of years ago, there was an article in the New York Times called Why We Make Bad Decisions. It was written by Marina Heads, who teaches economics at the University College in London. Now, let me read you a couple of lines. Anxiety, stress, and fear can distort our choices. Stress makes us prone to tunnel vision, less likely to take in the information we need. This is so important. If you're walking through this COVID-19 uh, situation with a high degree of fear, the decisions you're making are not necessarily good ones. You'll look back and regret the choices you made out of fear. So if you're experiencing fear right now, this is God's word to you. Do not fear, I am with you. So you have a choice in your life to reject fear and instead choose faith. So now let's talk about faith. Look again at what God told his people not to fear. He said, I am with you. I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you. Does any of those things change the reality of the situation they were in? Did it change the military threat that the early faithful were facing? Not at all. That threat still existed. So when I say choose faith over fear, I don't mean denying the reality of the situation. God calls us to be realists. So here's the reality. Because of the COVID-19 virus, you and most people you know will experience real distress in the coming days, if you haven't already. Some of us will have to cancel very important events like graduations or family vacations, some of us will experience significant financial loss. Some of us will get sick. Some may die. And some of you are wishing you never turned into this worship service, because Reverend Teresa is so depressing. But friends, it's true. Jesus told his disciples, in this world, you will have trouble. And part of our trouble is called COVID-19. So what does it mean to have faith in the midst of very real trouble? It means trusting that God is ultimately bigger than the trouble, that God will outlast the trouble, and that God walks with us through the trouble. I am with you. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you. Do you believe that? Because if you do, it changes everything. If you catch yourself lying in bed at night, unable to sleep, worrying, remind yourself of this truth. Just repeat these four promises. I am with you. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you. You know, back in 1948, the atomic bomb had just been developed. And because of that new reality, fear was spreading across the world. And C.S. Lewis wrote this really great little piece called On Living in the Atomic Age. And it was about how our faith in Jesus Christ should affect the way we live in a world where atomic war was a real threat. And the whole thing is worth reading, but let me read you just one section. And every time he says atomic bomb, replace it with coronavirus. And here's what he wrote. It is perfectly ridiculous to go whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death to a world which already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. This is the first point to be made. The first action is to pull ourselves together. If we're going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things, praying, working, 
teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint and a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies. A microbe can do that, but they may not, or they need not, dominate our minds. Friends, the truth is the coronavirus might break our bodies, but it cannot touch our, uh, cannot touch our souls, and therefore, it doesn't have to dominate our minds. I appreciate C.S. Lewis's list of sensible and human things. I thought a lot about that this week. Over the next few weeks, some of us are going to have a little more time on our hands. Not all of us. But some of us are going to be working from home. So we'll save all that commuting time. Many of us will have events cancelled. So we'll have that time. So here's my point. If I really have faith that God is in control of all of this, rather than focusing on everything I can't do, I'm going to open my eyes to the extra things I can do. Reading more, praying more, exercising more, maybe sleeping more, spending quality time with family, cleaning, decluttering the house, doing house projects and yard work, finally catching up on the television shows we've recorded, spending time with my spouse Ruth. So listen, the first choice we need to make is an internal choice. During these next several weeks, rather than letting fear dominate you and limit you, allow faith to release you and expand you. And that's only possible because God, who says, I am with you, I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you. Now there's another choice that all of us are faced with right now, and this is an external choice. And here it is. Friends, choose love over selfishness. Over these next few weeks, because of the uncertainty and stress of it all, some of us will be tempted to turn inward and become extremely self-focused. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul talks about this human tendency towards selfishness. And here's what he says. This is Galatians 5, verse 13, if you want to look it up later. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. To be free. But don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Paul was writing to people who had become accustomed to a very religious, legalistic, and guilt-based approach to life. People who were constantly trying to prove that they were good enough for God's approval. And the message of Galatians is, because of Christ, we're freed from all that. So now, simply by trusting in Christ, we are permanently accepted by God. Paul says, you were called to be free. Now, you get to decide on how you're going to use that freedom. And Paul is advising them, he's encouraging them, now that you have this freedom, please don't use it just to indulge yourself. So I want to talk about selfishness. In recent days, I have seen some simply stunning acts of selfishness. Sometimes it comes out in the way we look at our supplies and resources. I really don't care what anybody else has. I've got four cases of hand sanitizer in my basement, and my second freezer is stocked with three dozen chickens. I'm good. The most disturbing kind of selfishness I've seen is people who are still not taking this seriously and basically flaunting the health precautions. They've decided, for whatever reason, that this whole thing is being blown out of proportion, and therefore they don't need to follow the guidelines. They see things like, oh, it's no worse than the flu. Or even if I get it, it's just like getting a cold and a sore throat. Last Monday, a professional basketball player named Rudy Gobert was at a post-game press conference. And on Monday, there was already a high level of concern, so they had required the, the reporters to be quite a distance away from the player that they were interviewing. So Gobert, Gobert sat at a table with a bunch of microphones on it. And at the end of the interview, he decided to mock the whole thing by reaching out and touching all the microphones. And two days later, on Wednesday evening, he tested positive for coronavirus. That was the night that the NBA shut down. And I just want to read what Rudy Goldberg, Rudy Goldberg said 
on Instagram after that. I have gone through so many emotions since learning of my diagnosis, mostly fear, anxiety, and embarrassment. The first and most important thing is I would like to publicly apologize to the people I may have endangered. At that time, I had no idea I was even infected. I was careless and made, and made no excuse. I hope my story serves as a warning and causes everyone to take this seriously. See, here's the thing. The reason he shouldn't have done what he did, the reason that we should wash our hands and avoid large gatherings and stay away from people who've recently traveled internationally, is not mostly for our own benefit. Rudy Gober is a young, healthy athlete. He's going to recover just fine. Many of us are relatively young and healthy. This is not about us, and that's just the point. We're being asked to make sacrifices and take precautions, mostly for the benefit of others, so we won't infect them. And people, Christians of all people, should rush to do that. Our faith teaches us to take special care of the most vulnerable, the elderly, the weak, the sick. It's time for us to stop the joking and the conspiracy theories and the silliness and the passive-aggressive acts of denial, because it's just flat-out selfish. You were called to be free. But don't use your freedom to indulge yourself. Rather, Paul says, serve one another, humbly in love. More than anything else, I believe this crisis presents us with an incredible opportunity to demonstrate love. So let's talk about love. One way we can show love, and it might be the most powerful way, is to start praying, specifically for the vulnerable people around you. So here's an idea. If you're like most people, you are washing your hands and sanitizing your hands way more than you used to, right? I keep hearing we're supposed to wash our hands for at least 20 seconds. And the first time I heard that, I thought, 20 seconds. That's it. And then I did it. And I realized, 20 seconds is kind of a long time. And I realized that all my life, I've been washing my hands in about 9 seconds. Now, some of you are judging me right now for that. I can't see your face, so that's okay. But here's an idea. Every time you have one of those mar marathon 20-second hand-washing sessions, use that time to pray for an elderly or vulnerable person that you know. You know, something like, Dear Lord, please protect Reverend George. Because they are really the most vulnerable people to this virus. Some of you are thinking, yeah, yeah, prayer is good. No, I mean seriously, how many times a day do you wash your hands? Six times? Eight times? Pray specifically for six or eight different people you know. In your family, in your neighborhood, in your church family, use that time to call, call on God's comfort and strength in their lives. It's a beautiful way to serve people. And then after you pray for them, start thinking about ways that you can tangibly minister to them. I mentioned earlier all the found time we have to do things like cleaning the house and exercising, and those things are great. But let's focus a little bit more outwardly for a moment. Instead of focusing on all the doors that are closed, work doors, travel doors, sports and concert doors, lots of doors are closing. Let's open our eyes, though, to new doors of service that God is opening. I truly believe that God is opening up unique ways that we can love people during this crisis. So instead of lamenting at the closed doors, let's look for the open ones. There's a really interesting historical parallel in the early days of the Christian church. There were numerous epidemics and plagues that just wreaked havoc on entire cities in the Roman Empire. And even though people back then didn't know anything about germs, they realized that they could protect themselves by getting out of the city. Those who had the money to do so would flee to the countryside, hunker down and bunker down until the danger had passed. But here's the remarkable thing. The Christians living in those cities did not flee. They viewed themselves as representing God in that city, so they stayed, and they served the people around them. Some historians believe this was one of the main reasons that the church in the first few centuries gained traction in their culture. Because instead of abandoning the ship during the crisis, 
they stayed, and at great risk to themselves, they demonstrated love. Friends, listen, this pandemic is going to pass, and when it does, how will people look at us? Will they see us as panicky conspiracy theorists who stockpiled food and reacted out of fear? Or will they see that our faith in God gave us a calmness and a passion to serve? Will they see us sharing generously with people in need? Will they see us reaching out and checking in on elderly people, offering to bring prescriptions and food and supplies to people who are shut in? Will they realize that even when we can't do church as usual by gathering on Sunday mornings, the church is more alive than ever? How will the coronavirus of 2020 define us? How will it define you? We all have choice to make. So choose faith over fear and choose love over selfishness. Now let me close by talking about one other choice. This past week has given us a chance to do something we very rarely get to do. Because everything has been shut down, we've had an opportunity to take a step back and to get some perspective on our lives. And for some of us, that's been a little uncomfortable. If you've built your life around sports, you probably are feeling major withdrawal symptoms by now. If you've gained, always gained your sense of importance from financial security, you might be feeling very insecure right now. If you've always found your sense of meaning from going to your job, you're probably feeling a strange emptiness right now because you realize that the thing you've leaned on is actually a very fragile thing. It can be taken away far too easily. So what do you do with that? Well, here's what most people do. They say, when, things, when will things get back to normal? When are sports coming back? When are the markets going to recover all these losses? When can I start going to concerts again? Now, actually, the kids at school are not saying that. They're not saying, when can we go back to school? A lot of them actually have seemed pretty happy about the break. But for some people who are feeling a sense of emptiness and loss, they're thinking, can we get back to normal as soon as possible? And that's totally, totally understandable. But wait a minute, maybe this thing that you're feeling is actually a gift to you. Maybe it's a gift that you'll never get again. To realize that this thing that you've always leaned on, that's always given you security and stability, can be pulled away so easily. Maybe that's a gift. Maybe that thing has been exposed for what it is, for a reason. Maybe it's an invitation to choose a more stable foundation for your life, something that can never be taken away. So today I want to leave you with a reminder of the one thing that can never be taken away. In Romans chapter 8, we read this, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, or anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hold to this truth, and we'll get through this crisis together. Amen. Our next hymn can be found in more voices. Number 90, Don't Be Afraid.
May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember the most vulnerable. May we who have the luxury of working from home remember those who have to choose between preserving, preserving their health and making their rent. May we who have the flexibility to care for our children when their schools close remember those who have no options. May we who have to cancel our trips remember those who have no safe place to go. May we who are losing our money in the tumult, the turbulence of the economic market, remember those who have no money at all. May we who settle in for a quarantine at home, remember those who have no home. As few grips our country, let us choose love. During this time, when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us yet find ways to be the loving embrace of God to our neighbours. Amen. And now can I invite you to pray for the Our Father with me. Our Mother and Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is found in Voices United 595, We Are Pilgrims. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.